welcome back to my channel. Oh, hold on a second. All right. Well, welcome back. I have been absent. I, I came down with some sort of sickness, and then I had to do some work travel, which I will actually have some some video content based on that travel. I can't talk about it yet, but it was really fun. Uh, and unfortunately, that travel. <laughs> I had to leave the morning that I was working on my Acolyte review, so uh, I don't, I didn't have the setup to make that video on the road. Uh, I did post a couple different reviews of the show, uh, the new Star Wars show, The Acolyte, starring Carrie Ann Moss, the uh, lead actor of every se every episode. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, the the series came out earlier this week, and the first two episodes. So I wrote a review with only really minor spoilers of those first two episodes. Then I watched all four. I wanted to watch the first two to sort of get like, okay, here's what audiences are going to experience the first two episodes. Let me experience that at the same time as the audience. And then I'll watch the rest of my screeners. I got four screeners. Critics were all given four screeners. So then I watched the other two and I wrote another piece because after the first two, I was like, well, I don't love this, but... I mean, maybe it gets better. Like maybe the maybe the reason that the critics are uh, are, are 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 giving this ninety one percent versus the twenty six percent audience rating. Maybe the reason for that is that they watched all four episodes, and I haven't, and audiences haven't. So then I watched the next two, and if anything, I felt like the third episode made the show a lot worse, <laughs> uh, and I can't talk about why, but. It's a very, very bad episode. And then the fourth episode definitely had probably the best of the season. Uh, but it en it ends on a frustrating cliffhanger that's sort of like, why didn't you just make this episode longer? I think it's like half an hour long. And it literally feels like they're just toying with us. Like, oh, you're going to tune, tune in next week because we decided to randomly end the episode here. And that's sort of like how the first couple episodes also felt like, we're just going to end the episode here. Just because it doesn't really have a f the sense that we actually finished what we were trying to do with this episode, but we're going to end it here. The third episode, even though it's the worst, sort of is a bottle episode in a way, and it, it does sort of feel like it has a full story, but the, all the other episodes feel like this very sort of disjointed and jarring. Uh, but critics are giving this 91%, audiences 26%. I thought I'd go check my profile here. The last thing that... that Let's see. Yeah, the la my profile, my shit has now been updated with Rotten Tomatoes. They're they're supposed to update it with reviews um, automatically, just because I'm in the system. But sometimes you have to go and do it yourself, and I don't know why. I don't know why nothing has been updated here for so long. Um, I I forget to do it, but I thought, hey, let's go, let's go add a, my review to this. Uh, to the I think I have to refresh it. Um, yeah, let's add my review. So I'm going to say that this is my review. I wrote two, but the first is only for um, the first two episodes. Whereas this one is my feelings about the first four, just like the rest of critics. I'm going to copy the link and head over here. I'm giving it rotten because I don't think it deserves, you know, I don't have a score. Um, and let's see, my pull quote will just be my little blurb here. Uh, oh, where is it? Oh, there it is. The Acolyte is a deeply bland, relentlessly mediocre Star Wars show that pairs some cool fight scenes with wooden dialogue and a predictable mystery. Bing! Forbes. I agree to their terms. All right. Boom. Submit. Okay. But, um... Oh, okay. Star Wars The Acolyte. Uh, let's look at some of these critic reviews. Oh, see, there are a few that aren't... All right. Well, let's see these negative ones first. The new setting and splashy visuals aren't enough to save this cringe-inducing story. Well, that's true. With a ho-hum cast and obscure premise, flat performances, banal placeholder dialogue, and some shonky, unattractive prosthetics, the Acolyte is yet another discarded toy like toy line to check in Disney's growing bargain bin of busted franchise expansions. Well said, Eddie Harrison at Film Authority. Um, but but so many of these, some of them are like damning. Like they're like, yeah, it's all right, and they get a they get a fresh tomato. 
some of them are are like oh here here's david reddish Star Wars hasn't felt so pregnant with possibilities since the announcement of the prequel trilogy back in the 1990s. Even if a single show can't realize all of those possibilities, viewers will find themselves tantalized. Tantalized? I mean, I get it if you're like, you know, like, I had fun with this show. And I mean, look, everybody's allowed to have their opinion. I just feel like critics are supposed to have critical opinions. Like, you're supposed to be a little bit more critical than the average Joe, right? They're just, okay, so it's 91%. I'm not going to go through a lot of these because it's, it's I, I, I don't know. There's, there's, I read a lot of them that were like, it's a compelling thriller or, a, or you know, a, a brilliant mystery. I was just looking at one a minute ago where they said it, uh, it was actually, this was a Reddit post where someone was like, I love how it's like a police procedural. I mean, police procedurals require you to have the procedures that police use to find bad guys. Now, let's look at the Acolyte. We'll talk about the first two episodes with spoilers because they're out there already. We have this assassin, May, who goes and kills this Jedi, Indara, uh, played by Carrie Ann Moss. And, uh, in the, you know, she's killed off in the very first scene, which a lot of people found kind of irksome. And, I, yeah, it's annoying. She does come back for flashbacks, but her character is dead. Uh... Interestingly, and we're going to get to the diversity stuff here in a minute, but okay, I'll just save it. Uh, so anyways, the, then this uh, we, we after this scene, it cuts to this person that looks just like the assassin May, and uh, she is arrested for the murder, and there's like one witness, this, this alien guy, and he's like, yeah, she did it. And they're like, yep, even though you have a really good alibi, we're going to, we're going to take you and put you in prison. Like, we're not going to do any more digging at all. Uh, and, and it's like, okay, but she has a really good alibi. She was really far away on a ship with other people who witnessed her there. But you're going to take this one witness and and then lock up a former Jedi. This, this we, we learn her name is Osha. And then, you know, pretty quickly we learn that they're twins. I mean, it's super obvious at this point, right? When she acts differently, she has an alibi, she's far away. We know as the audience right away that there's no way those are the same people. But these Jedi immediately are tossed the idiot ball. And this is a huge problem in this show. The idiot ball is passed around like fucking hot potatoes. Like, it's one stupid, inane decision after another in order to get the plot moving. And I hate that in shows. I really hate it. It's like you don't have every have to have everyone make brilliant choices, right? People should make mistakes in these in these stories because that makes things interesting. Mistakes drive story. Absolutely, mistakes create conflict. Uh, you know that's one way, right? Betrayal is another. You know, lies are another. There's a lot of ways you can create conflict and push the story along. The idiot ball is not the best one, where you just make people who should be smart, like Yord. He's this Jedi Knight, right? But he's as people say, a himbo. He's very stupid. He's full of himself. He's he's wrong about just about everything. And he's in charge of, of bringing her in. And they put her on a prisoner transport. <laughs> I mean, here she's a trained Padawan. And they put her on a, tr- a prisoner transport with, l- like, virtually no security. The idiot prisoners on this transport are able to escape almost instantly. And then, then they send uh, this... Um, uh, Jedi Master Soul, who's very, uh, who's my one of my favorite characters in the show. I, I really like him. Actually, they sent him. He was Osha's, you know, mentor or whatever. They sent him and some others, uh, his, his current one of his current Padawans, uh, to find her where she crash lands. And you know, through the course of this, they all realize, oh, she's got a twin, and it's like, yeah, maybe you should have, you know, remembered that. I mean, yes, they think she's dead, but they never saw the body, so. So, I don't know, like, there's, it turns out that May is after these four Jedi who visited her planet when they were kids, when her and Osha were kids, and she's getting revenge on them, and she kills two of them off in the first two episodes, and we're left kind of thinking, well, what happened? We heard, you know, we hear that, that, that May killed her whole family and killed everyone in a fire, clearly May thinks something else, May thought Osha was dead, Osha thought May was dead, so there is some mystery to solve here. There's some backstory we have to peel out, and maybe that'll be interesting, but to me, so far, it's all been super predictable, uh, 
and and I just find a lot of the writing is extremely wooden. It, it really reminds me of like Ahsoka and other other Disney shows. And maybe I'm just spoiled on Andor, which I'm also rewatching right now with my brother who hasn't seen it. Um, but the dialogue is so sharp and poignant, and like every exchange in Andor has meaning. <laughs> doesn't matter what characters are involved. There's every exchange, something important is said. The, the writing is sharp and tight. And here it just feels, and you know what? Like a lot of people say, you know, Star Wars is supposed to be cheesy. It's supposed to be da da da. And yeah, to some degree, I'm fine with cheese and Star Wars going together, right? Like there is a place for it, right? But I feel like in, in this era, or maybe just as time has gone on, maybe even in the prequels, definitely in the prequels with Jar Jar and stuff, we've gone so far in that direction that we've lost something that made Star Wars great in the in the beginning, which was that Star Wars was a show with depth and and emotion. And for instance, you know, one of the things that made Return of the Jedi work so well for me is that is they are is Luke's arc with Vader with his father, that final scene where they have that amazing lightsaber battle. Now, sure, as far as far as battles and choreography and all that go, it's not the best lightsaber duel in the world, but the emotion, right, the feeling, is so powerful. Luke's attempts to to bring his father back to the light. And meanwhile, well, you know, the Emperor is sitting there trying to bring Luke over the darkness. And there's this balance. It's, t- it's all sitting on this, this, the, 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 the tip of a lightsaber, right? Uh, which way will it go? And ultimately, you know, that moment, which I still think is the, the culmination of all things in Star Wars, is the moment where Vader stands up, walks over, picks up the Emperor, and throws him over the edge. That is the moment the culminating moment where balance is restored, where Anakin is redeemed, Luke is saved. You can't top that moment in Star Wars ever. Don't even try. You can't. Because it brings it all together. And that's the problem. Okay, maybe this is another video. Maybe this is a whole other video. That's the problem with Star Wars, trying all these ways to, to keep going. Right? The prequels were this attempt to like, hey, let's explain who Vader was. But we didn't really need it. You know? Like, fundamentally, we didn't really need to know more about Vader. I, I posted something about Rings of Power the other day on Facebook. Just talking about how like Galadriel's character in Lord of the Rings works so well because she's mysterious. We didn't need Galadriel to go on the adventure, right? Any more than we needed Elrond to. But she's more mysterious than Elrond. But It's not about how much screen time a character gets, right? It's not about how much of the story they get. It's about how much of an impact they have on the story. So Galadriel has a huge impact on the story. And her character, even though she's a very small part of the books or the movies, is one that resonates and and echoes in our memory for a long, long time after we we see her. Because she is so powerful and, and frightening and beautiful and, you know, and and she, you know, helps the adventurers or whatever. The Rings of Power tries to tell, like, the story of Galadriel when she was young and spunky and the commander of the Northern Armies. And it's it's a much, you know, she does not resonate. She does not stick with you. And it's not just because the writing's bad. And it's not just because the actress isn't right for the role. It's because that character doesn't need it. And neither did Vader. We didn't need, we didn't need Anakin's entire story told. Because we, we have... We know that he's gone to the dark side. We know that he's been corrupted by the Emperor. We know that he's been one of the leading forces of evil in the galaxy. And he is this ominous presence throughout. And yet, in the end, when it finally matters and his son is about to die, he turns. He comes to the light. He saves his son. And he dies in the process. And it's beautiful. I mean, it's a beautiful moment. I just think that when people say Star Wars has always been cheesy, Star Wars has always been goofy, it's always been, we've always had, yeah, we had Ewoks and stuff in the original trilogy. We had silly little Jawas. We had that stuff. But we also had a heroic arc that spanned three films that led to that moment. And that was powerful. That's why Andor works for me, because it's powerful. And, and, and in, in the first, 
season of the Mandalorian, you know, we have sacrifice. We have this, these moments of like, of real sadness that, that accompany the moments of cuteness and goofiness and all that. Star Wars has to be a little bit of all these things. So when we come to the Acolyte, like this, this show is billed as dark like Andor, right? But it's not. It's filled with goofy stuff. It's, it doesn't have, it doesn't know what tone it's trying to achieve. And, and sure, again, Star Wars original trilogy, it has tone that, that ranges from, from lighthearted and goofy, you know, Han Solo bitching at uh, Chewbacca or vice versa or like the droids, you know. Um, and again, I, was, I would say this one more. Th- one of the other things that made the original trilogy so great was the, the characters, the, the, the amazing cast of characters and the way they interacted with one another. I mean, there is no Star Wars, including Andor, which I love. There's no other Star Wars that does characters so well. There's no nothing that equals Luke, Leia, Han, Chewbacca, R two D two, C three PO, right? That core cast. There's, you know, they tried it in this in the sequel trilogy, and they totally screwed the pooch. Um, people say that the Star Wars fandom is toxic because people are mad about the new shows and stuff. But let me just say this, like, and I've said this before to some degree or in different ways, but imagine something you love dearly being taken over by people who don't seem to love it and want to just change it into something else. How are you not supposed to be upset by this? I mean, like, I do agree that people can go way over the top with how angry they are over Star Wars because it is just a fucking, it's just a show and, you know, movies and shows and books. But part of being passionate about something is being passionate about when it goes downhill. Just like True Detective, right? Right. I mean, I think every season of True Detective had detractors who were like, uh, what happened to our the quality of season one, right? And and Night Country just like put the cherry on top. Uh, there's, you know, like my reaction to the Willow show, you know, maybe I was toxic or maybe I love the Willow, sh- the Willow movie so much that I just truly believe that it deserves something better. And I I don't know that the, the show with its cringy modern dialogue and rock songs and all that that just didn't feel anything like the the original film i think it's oh i think it's really it's not just fair for people to be upset i think it's required for people to be upset because you why change stuff that's so good the way it is unless you're going to do something Equally good or powerful or amazing. I would say that Andor... I'm going to keep coming back to Andor. Andor does something different than the original trilogy, right? It, it sort of takes, like, those those moments in Imperial... The Imperial uh, meetings, you know? Uh, those those moments where, you know, all the space Nazis sitting around tables. And it's like, let's do that. Let's just pluck that out. And now let's, you know, let's get rid of all the Vader and Luke and all the Star Wars uh, you know, Force stuff. And let's just... Let's figure out how this bureaucracy and then this rebellion, how that works, like that conflict. And I love that they sort of plucked that out and were like, let's do this. And, you know, the Acolyte feels <laughs> feels like it's like, hey, we're going to go in a totally new era of the High Republic, but we're just going to have a, you know, we're just going to like throw a bunch of fan service at you. There's, there's going to be more lightsabers than you've ever seen in a single room before. It honestly, it feels a lot like the prequels to me, uh, which I guess is why some people probably really like it and people like me really don't because I find the prequels to be atrocious. Uh, and the Acolyte, like, do I like anything about it? I mean, there's some cool fight scenes. I, I liked the one, I can't think of his name right now, but the one Jedi master who was just sort of meditating in the air, uh, King Tommen from Game of Thrones and the um, the guy, one of the main actors from 1917, which is a wonderful movie, by the way. That's the actor who plays him. Now, Indara, she seemed like a cool Jedi. We're going to get... In a second, we'll get to that. But um, I like I like the guy who... I can't think of his name. Kimir, I think is his name. He's played by the actor who plays Jason in The Good Place. He's really great. And I there's a lot of theories that he is the Sith. Uh, that That's like... Or the whatever, the guy that's trained May and stuff. And uh, I think that's actually a really good theory. I think it's, I think it might actually be true. And I think he does a wonderful job. Uh, I like a, a, a Jedi Master Soul, who's played by the actor from the uh, Squid Games. 
Squid Game, Squid Games, yeah. Uh, and uh, Daphne Keen plays the the little Padawan girl. I think she's sorely underused. Like she's a great actor. She's from Logan and his Dark Materials and. I don't know. Her character's weird. She's always talking crap to Yord, which I get because he's really dumb. Uh, I feel like she she could be a great character. Uh, there's a there's a Jedi Wookie, and uh, he could be a great character. Though, if the first two episodes are any indication of his fate, we probably won't have him around for long. So, what I don't like what I don't like is kind of the main story. I guess I feel like this is the wrong story being told. Uh, yes, it's, it's, they're trying to do, I think, Frozen meets Kill Bill, so we've got, like, the twins from, you know, the sisters from Frozen meet Kill Bill, this revenge story of this, you know, assassin going out to, to kill all the people who wronged her. It's hilarious to think that, that this could be anywhere on the same level of quality of either of those. I mean, I'm, I kind of hate Frozen, but I admit it's a good movie, right? Kill Bill, parts one and two. I've, I have my problems with those movies, but they are really great movies compared to Star Wars. Or this, kind of, this level of Star Wars, anyways. Uh, I don't like May or Osha that much. I just don't think that that dynamic is interesting. And I think maybe if they had played the twin thing out longer, or if they'd written it better so that we didn't have any clue that there was a twin dynamic going on and that was a big revelation, maybe that would work. Uh, I just think that her that these characters are really flat. Like, I don't I don't really find them to be particularly compelling. Her revenge story doesn't have much bite to it because we don't really know what happened. Like, at least we learned pretty early on in Kill Bill, like, why she's trying to kill these bastards, right? We get a pretty good sense of it. Whereas here, we're like, well, did they do something wrong? I, you know, they seem like pretty good people to me. Is this just a misunderstanding? And then there's just a lot of cheesy stuff, like when we first see the Sith, whoever he is, you know, he's he's talking in a very scary voice, and then pew, he pulls out his red lightsaber. It's like, why did he pull out the? Why did he let the? What did he do that for? He's just standing alone on a beach. Like, does he just like stand there and like pew, randomly? I don't know. <laughs> it just feels like this show made by people who who say they're fans of Star Wars, but you can say you're a fan of something and still not really understand it, right? Like, this was my heartbreak over the Willow TV show. It's, it's like, they all talked about what, what fans they were. You know, and I, and, and I thought, cool, this is great. Like, but then they made a show that seemed to totally misunderstand what, what the movie Willow was trying to do. And, you know, and I guess it just depends, right? I mean, Tony Gilroy, who made Andor, he only hired people who weren't fans. But he made a show that felt, in all the details, very Star Wars, right? Whereas, you know, John Favreau, with the first season of The Mandalorian, he's a huge fan, and that was a wonderful season of TV. So, I don't know. I don't know what, like, your, your, if your fan card really matters that much, but I think an understanding of the, of what makes something work does. Like, like if I were to go make, if I were in charge of adapting, like, a romance, a romance novel. Now, I don't, I'm not a fan of romance novels, but... What I would do is I would really try to study two things. First, what makes a romance novel work? And, and second, who likes romance novels? What's my target audience? And see, I don't think that's what they're doing here. They're not, they're not, uh, I don't know why I'm keeping that scene up. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's what they're doing here. Uh, they, they're, they're, you know, like, so if I were to take some, uh, Danielle Steele, is that her name? She's like really famous. And I'm like, we're going to adapt this to a TV show or, or a movie. And, you know, okay, well, all right. I'd read some of the books. I'd figure out what the formula is. You know, I'd go on to Reddit. I'd read some fans' like comments. And I'd, I'd put myself in their shoes. I would try to understand why, why do people like... I'd go to the bookstore, use bookstore. And I'd find the books and I'd find the scene where the books seem to have been read the most, you know. Oh, what do people like? You know, this, these pages are the most worn. I'd, uh, you know, I mean, that's just what I, I would think as an adapter of something who knows nothing about it. Now, if I, if I already know something about it, let's say I was going to adapt one of my favorite books, like Joe Abercrombie's First Loss trilogy, right? And I was going to make those into, into films, one film per book. Well, okay, you know, I, I know those books. I've read them multiple times. I've got a blurb on one of the covers from one of my reviews. That, and that's pretty cool, right? 
All right, what makes them work, right? What is the tone? Who, and, and, and what is the world? What, what kind of world are we trying to create? What makes it tick? And see, where I think these days a lot of people are getting into trouble with is two things. They want to make this their own. Now, I would not want to make Joe Abercrombie's works my own. I would want to try to find the most faithful way to adapt those books to the screen, now, understanding that I am a surgeon at this point, cutting away things delicately, because you can't, you just literally can't have everything. You can't translate one-to-one. -one. You can't, and you're going to have to make choices. People will disagree with those. I accept that. Je Peter Jackson in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, he made choices I disagreed with, but I understand he did the best he could. He was not trying to make it his own. He was trying to make the best adapt adaptation he could within the limitations he had. Okay, so you take the first law. The Blade itself is the first book of that. Okay, we have two. We have two hours, right? We have to take this book, turn it into two hours. How, what do we? What do we? What are the most important things about this book? So we make those value judgments, right? The story beats that are the most important. The characters are the most important. You know, and and then you have to just start just figuring out like how do you visualize that using real people and sets and all that. Now, I think the second thing that people tr run into, and this is kind of related to people making it their own, is that there's this dire need to make everything as diverse as possible, right? So in the in the Abercrombie books, there's a lot of different regions, right? You've got the north with all the barbarian types. You've got the you got the sort of the main sort of imperial area that has, you know, in its cities at least, a lot more diversity. But still, you know, foreigners, whether they're northern or barbarians or they're eastern from, uh, I can't think of the name of the country right now, um, whatever, darker skinned people though, right? There's a lot of like bigotry and there's a lot of nativism and stuff that goes on. And that's conveyed in the books, especially in the third trilogy where, but really throughout. So... I would personally, looking at these books, say these regions matter. So, it, so for for the North, we're going to portray these people, you know, as kind of like Norsemen, right? Vikings, big, hairy, pale skin types, right? For for the for the um, so the mainland, the main. I'm sorry, it's been a while, so I can't remember the names off the top of my head. But they were going to be more like the British Empire, right? They're going to look like British people, like sort of. You know, pompous, la di da di da, but in the city, you know, of course, you can have you're gonna have some racial diversity and stuff. Uh, and then, you know, the you know, as they're described in the books, the the, the Eastern Empire is going to be more dark skinned people. And you know, there's a character in the books who's from that region who constantly refers derogatorily to white people as pinks. And I think it's hilarious. I think it's a wonderful detail, and I would want that in there too. Now, the problem with the current moment, the current current cultural moment, is that when people adapt stuff, they're, they're not thinking, okay, why do these regions matter? Why do the racial dynamics matter? How does that work with the story? They're thinking, we need a lot of diversity. So, I guarantee you that if some, some of these people, like the Witcher people adapting those books, they would make the barbarians multiracial. They would make uh, everyone all multiracial from all the different areas. And then you just sort of lose the whole dynamic that is created in the books. You lose that, 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 how the different regions interact. And see, the thing that drives me crazy is whenever you talk about diversity, people are like, you're just racist. You just hate diversity. And it's like, no, I actually think, I think it's more interesting when there is actual diversity. But that's like cultural diversity. And in a story, a fantasy story, a historical story, that, that means you can't just make it at a, a, you know, a hodgepodge of different skin colors, like skin, like you're, you're blind to skin color. It always weirded me out in The Witcher when, the, when there was so much racial diversity, but they were like racist against the elves. But like the only difference between the elves and the humans was that the elves had pointy ears. And they were just, there wasn't skin color differences. They didn't, nobody saw skin color. Nobody was bigoted against that, just against pointy ears. It was so, it's just so jarring. Like it, it's hard to, it's hard for me to accept that that's real or that that makes any sense. Anyways. So what about diversity in the Acolyte? I have been rambling in this video, um, making up for my lost days, I guess. Diversity in the Acolyte is really weird because I feel like the entire purpose of it is not just to like promote diversity, but to like poke the bear of the culture wars. Literally, by the end of the second episode, there are no 
living white people in the show who aren't in, under a pound of makeup. The only white people left on the show are either completely green or completely made up to be an alien. Everyone else is either black, Asian, pretty much just black or Asian. I don't actually think there are any Latino or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's it. The whole cast. And, and it's like, okay, like I don't personally care. Like whatever you want to do. Like it's a space opera. There's, it's very, it's supposed to be diverse, right? But isn't it a little weird that you, that you go that route and you just think this will be fine. This is, no, I think they're doing it on purpose. That's what annoys me most about this. I don't think it's because they're trying to be woke. I think it's because they're trying to, they're just being dipshits. They want to, they're trying to poke the bear of the anti-woke. That's it. That's what they're trying to do. It's, it's, and that to me feels like using, they're using people, they're using minorities, they're using women, they're using diversity as a cudgel to start a flame war online. Because th there's no other explanation for it. I mean, like I've said, Andor does diversity better. There's a wide range of, of, of female male characters. There is a lesbian relationship in that show. There are black people, Asian people, white people. Hispanic people. There's probably more diversity in Andor, actually. There's probably more diversity in Andor than there is in the Acolyte. But it's not ever, like, just thrown in your face. It feels very natural. It all feels very organic. And that's the difference. And that's why, I, I mean, I don't think that, that Andor is any less progressive of a show. Like, Andor is a show about revolution against a, a fascist empire, right? Like Star Wars in general, right? I would say it's much more political even than the Acolyte so far. But it just doesn't just throw it in your face like, hey, hey, look at us. Look at how diverse we are. Look at our credentials. That's the problem I have with the Acolyte. It just seems to want so hard for you to notice, just like She-Hulk. And at that point, it's like, are you interested in telling a story? Or are you just trying to, are you just really, really trying too hard? It's, you just try hards. That's all you are. Uh, and if you want to tell, if you want to tell a meaningful story and you want to have actual diversity that works, you have to think a little bit more deeply about that, like Andor. So, uh, the second two episodes, or the third and fourth episodes, I should say, come out over the next two weeks. I think it's going to be a weird drip of content because I just don't think in this age, like, I like weekly releases, but like, if the weekly release is like an hour long episode and it gives me a full, satisfying story, great if it's like 30 minutes long and it ends without really pushing the story forward or ends on a jarring cliffhanger not so great so i think the next two episodes are going to be kind of frustrating even for fans although fans these days double down so hard on loving something that that, it, that they act like actual psychopaths who can't who can't even i mean i even when i love something i I'm, I'm hope i can see where it's flawed where there's cracks in the design that's nothing wrong with that. You can you can love something and realize that it's not perfect. But anyways, let me know what you think about the Acolyte. I know I rambled on a long time and covered a lot of different subjects in this video. Uh, I hope you enjoy. Thank you for watching. Like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and peace.